All right, I think I'm going to get us started. Uh, I want to welcome everyone that's there uh, in the cafe and who's online to the second in our uh, 2024 uh, lecture series. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to do the introduction uh, for um, Dr. Mike Levin. Uh, he's a developmental or maybe synthetic biologist uh, who um, has a distinguished professorship at Tufts University. Um, he's uh, really began his career as a geneticist, uh, received his doctorate at Harvard, uh, looking at the genetic uh, underpinnings of asymmetries in embryonic um, uh, developmental trajectories. And he's really been doing that vein of work for the last two and a half or more decades. Um, in that time, he's uh, published hundreds of papers and has, by my account, something like 35,000 citations uh, and counting and uh, a number of different honors that you can uh, see uh, on his wiki page. Uh, so I'll point you uh, to if you want to learn more about that. Um, Mike, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think you first came into Templeton's orbit. Um, what I found in the system was that you applied for funding in 2014 uh, for uh, an OFI related to uh, artificial mind and affecting will through quantum effects. And that was part of um, the program with Al Mealy at FSU on free will. Yeah. That ultimately um, didn't uh, lead to an invitation to full proposal. Um, and what I what else I saw in the system was that it was another five years before you applied. And that was to the life sciences when we ran an ideas challenge, which was a program trying to foment new ideas on the science of purpose. And that was open to anyone in the US. And we had offered $50, $1,000 prizes uh, for the best ideas as judged by an independent uh, review panel. And um, you could submit as many ideas as you want, but those were judged in a blinded fashion where uh, we didn't know who the, the submitter was. And you ended up winning two of those awards. Um, and uh, those were $1,000 each paid to the individual, not to the institution. Uh, so we got hundreds of submissions and that was really the beginning of us funding in this priority. So not only did you get that distinguished award, which may or may not actually feature on the wiki page, um, but you did parlay that obviously through conversation into the grant that you're gonna be speaking at least in part on today. Um, maybe the one thing I wanna say um, to those of you who don't know Mike, never interacted with him is that uh, I guess my conversation at this point, my introduction has been very quantitative, but qualitatively, whenever you speak with Mike, uh, if you have the privilege, the fun is is talking to someone who has a very generative, creative mind um, that feels a lot like popcorn popping when you talk to him. And so I'm really excited for the talk this morning. Thank you for being with us, Mike. And uh, I uh, yield the floor to you now. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a very kind introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you for all the support over the years. I'll talk more about that um, at the end. Uh, and it is my pleasure to um, share some uh, ideas with you all. Uh, what, um, what I would like to do is uh, to cover three main points here. And the first is that I'm going to talk about the fact that we are all made of a kind of agential material. Uh, we are made of uh, cells and actually subcellular components that have an important kind of intelligence. For the purposes of this talk, we'll boil that down to problem solving capacity. I'm going to introduce you to uh, an important uh, concept called bioelectricity, which functions as a kind of cognitive glue. This uh, is something that binds the tiny little goals of individual um, cells and, and uh, components like that together into uh, a larger emergent uh, individual with the goals and preferences and so on that, um, that none of their parts have. And I'm going to talk about how this actually, the, these, these philosophical ideas actually cash out as advances in biomedicine. And for example, I'll mention cancer as literally a dissociative identity disorder of the collective morphogenetic intelligence of your body. And then uh, I want to talk um, a bit at the end about uh, the implications that novel embodiments have for ethics and beyond some uh, really what I think are quite untenable dichotomies that need to be dumped in our journey to uh, to human flourishing and to ethical relationships with um, other, other beings. And um, uh, a large part of this talk can be uh, kind of uh, summed up by saying that the collection, uh, collective intelligence of groups of cells that navigate anatomical space, so the space of possible um, uh, for shapes and functions, uh, that will lead us to develop a conceptual framework for diverse intelligence. And I want to show how these deep philosophical ideas can actually become therapeutics. They move on to empirical application. So let's start. Let's start here. Uh, this is a, a, a very uh, well-known uh, painting called Adam Naming the Animals in the Garden of Eden. 
And what this painting uh, reflects is a couple of interesting things. Um, it was, it was one, one thing that I think is very deep and true, and one thing that I think is a profound error that, that we're, we're going to correct. Um, the thing that's an error is that what you see here is uh, a very clear demarcation between all the different creatures. So there's a discrete set of specific static forms. Um, in fact, Adam is, of course, is supposed to be different from all of these. And so on, and and so and so, uh, we're going to go beyond this idea of discrete natural kinds for these. The thing that I, I think is is uh, very very correct here is that um, there's an old um, tradition in which um, uh, Adam had to be the one to name the animals, not God, not the angels. Adam had to be the one to do it, and that's for two reasons. One is that he was the one that was going to have to live with these things uh, in in perpetuity, and also uh, this idea that um, by naming things, you discover their true nature. In other words, it was on him to, to take the effort to discover the true nature of these beings and thus come up with appropriate names for them. Because in, in of course, old traditions, knowing the name of something is, is, is very powerful. And, and I think this is profoundly true because we are going to have to name in the sense of discover the true nature of a wide variety of novel beings with whom we will have to live uh, well beyond anything that was imagined by um, the authors of, of these paintings. So the first thing we know in modern science is that around what's known as a, a typical modern human, uh, this kind of special thing that has this agential glow that all the philosophy uh, papers are about, you know, the, the human mind and so on. We know that we stand in the middle of a very smooth um, continuum. If you ask, well, what kind of human, you know, this one or something back here or what, uh, there are properties that go all the way back to single cells on the evolutionary timescale. We also know from developmental biology that even in our own lifetime, uh, there is a slow, smooth, continuous development from a single cell. So, so we already are starting to see that actually we can't just talk about this. We have to understand the continuum of it. And in fact, it, it gets much more interesting because not only that, but now uh, with, uh, with uh, advances in uh, synthetic morphology, bioengineering, and so on, uh, we now know that actually we are also in the middle of a continuum of, of all kinds of slow and gradual changes that can and will be made to the uh, standard um, default organism. These can be biological changes. These uh, can be technological changes because at every level of organization, we can combine engineered substrates with the uh, naturally evolved biological ones. They are, um, biology is extremely interoperable and we'll get to that towards the end. So um, now understanding that that this is a, that there's a there's a very smooth continuum of highly diverse uh, bodies and minds, uh, I'm interested in a framework uh, that can help us think about all of these things. Uh, it can help us recognize them. It can help us uh, create them, and cre and it can help us ethically relate to them. And I'm talking about, of course, not just the familiar creatures uh, such as apes and birds and maybe an octopus and things like that, but really uh, all kinds of things: colonial organisms, swarms. Uh, engineered life forms, artificial intelligence, whether software, purely software or robotically um, embodied, and at some point, maybe even uh, uh, exobiological agents. How can, we, how can we begin to think about all of these things on the same continuum? Now, I'm not the first person to try for this, of course, you know, uh, far back uh, as, as 1943, uh, Rosenbluth, Wiener, and Bigelow tried to come up with a um, a kind of uh, a ladder of different levels of cognition, all the way from passive matter all the way up to the kind of second order complex metacognition that we have. And so, so this is the kind of framework that I, that I want to develop. Um, I, my my uh, focus is on ones that move experiment forward. So I'm not just interested in philosophical ideas, but actually with something that helps us uh, facilitate new discovery, that's essential. And also uh, equally or even more important, helps us to define better ethical frameworks that are more grounded in the reality of, uh, of life. So one of the things that um, we've been working on is this notion of, a, of an axis of persuadability. Taking an engineering perspective on the wide spectrum of systems around us, we see that uh, as we move up this ladder from simple mechanical systems to kind of um, you know, cybernetic homeostats to learning agents and all the way up to humans and whatever is beyond that, uh, what we see is that what happens here is that there is a different set of tools that you need to optimally relate to these things. You know, something down here, you're not going to convince it of anything. You're not going to reward and punish it efficiently. All you're going to be able to do is rewire the hardware. But here you can start to think about the goals that it has in the simple set points and maybe rewriting the set point without rewiring the hardware. And then here, maybe you don't even need to know everything 
about how the system works because it offers an interface. You can train it, you can communicate with it. And, and then here you can really communicate in a very profound way. You can um, actually share agency with it and, and, and be vulnerable to um, be uh, you know, cognitively open to it and, and exchange information back and forth. So across this continuum of different tools, right? So as an engineer, the, the, the interesting thing that the engineering perspective gives you is that you can be very specific about asking, well, what tools do I need to bring to each of these systems? What helps us to understand and to relate to it? We can ask a simple question. Um, where do cellular collectives fit here? And, and this, is, this is an empirical question. It is not enough to have um, philosophical uh, pre-commitments to where things go. So some people assume that, well, cells, they're just, they're just mechanical machines. They have to be back here. Uh, but we can't just have, have um, armchair um, uh, feelings about it. We have to do experiments. And so it's especially important because we were all once, quote unquote, just physics. We all started life as a uh, unfertilized oocyte, a little blob of, of, of chemistry. And eventually we become something like this or even something like this, which is going to make uh, statements about um, not being a machine and so on. Um, and we now owe a story about how did we get from here to here? What happened during this process? Because developmental biology does not offer any uh, bright line at which point you go from, from being a blob of chemistry and physics to being an actual real mind. Um, okay, so, so we know we somehow scale up from whatever's going on here to this kind of status. We know we do that slowly, but at least we're a true unified intelligence. We're not a, a metaphorical um, collective intelligence like, a, like an ant colony, right? I mean, we're, we, we, we've, we feel like a, like a single unified being. Well, and especially Rene Descartes um, thought that, that this was the case. And he was very interested in the pineal gland, which is uh, singular in the brain. And he felt that that um, matches our, our experience as, as unified uh, intelligences and as, as humans. But if he had access to good microscopy, what he would have found was that inside that pineal gland are a huge number of cells. And inside of each of those cells, there's a huge number of these little, little machines. There isn't one of anything anywhere. All intelligence is collective intelligence. We are all made of parts. And the research program is to understand how those parts uh, come together to form something uh, more than the sum of its parts. This is a single cell. Uh, this is the kind of, I mean, this is a free living organism, but this is the kind of thing that we are all made of. Um, it has no brain. It has no nervous system. It is a single cell, but it has incredible competencies at meeting its metabolic, its anatomical, all the different um, goals that it has at the level of a single cell. And one of the things that um, is needed to become a uh, more than the sum of those parts is a kind of cognitive glue. And what I mean by that is that if you train, let's say you train this rat um, to press a lever and get a reward, well, the cells at the bottom of the feet are interacting with the lever, the cells in the gut are receiving the sugar of the reward. No individual cell has both of these experiences. Who owns that associative memory? Who is, who is this rat that now um, can bind the experience of, of, of its different parts into a, uh, a piece of information that is um, uh, only known by the collective and not by any of the individuals? Now, um, we, we're used to this from neuroscience that, that, that the electrical um, networks in our, in our brain allow us to uh, somehow co cohere out of individual cells. But um, there are a number of um, scenarios in biology that, that show us that we really haven't uh, yet understood what's actually going on here. This is, um, this is a caterpillar. So caterpillars live in a two-dimensional world. Uh, they eat leaves and they have a little brain suitable for driving this sort of pneumatic um, kind, of, uh, kind of device. Uh, it's a soft-bodied thing. There's nothing to push on in a caterpillar. You, gotta, you have to um, control it other ways. Uh, the caterpillar has to become a butterfly. Butterflies fly. They live in a three-dimensional world. They um, uh, drink nectar and, uh, and they have a completely different brain suitable for driving this kind of body. During this process, what happens? The brain basically dissolves. Uh, all the connections are broken. Most of the cells are killed. And you've got this, and then, and then you reconstitute a new brain. Now, uh, one amazing thing is that um, butterflies and moths remember information that the caterpillars were trained on. And you might think that the key question here is, where is the information stored? How is it possible that this individual, this, this collective being, is thoroughly refactored and still remembers the original information? Where is it? But it's, more that, it's actually much more than that. The real question isn't just where is it? The idea here is that you cannot store static information because the information on, uh, let's, say, let's say you train the caterpillar to find um, leaves in a particular color disc, uh, that information in itself is irrelevant to the butterfly. The butterfly doesn't want leaves and it doesn't move around the way caterpillars do. What happens here is that that information gets generalized 
and passed on. So, so when the butterfly has this new higher dimensional, literally a higher dimensional life than the, than the caterpillar, um, it's the deep lessons of, the, of its prior life, not the specific memories that it brings with it because it will also remember to go where, where the color disc is, but not because it wants leaves, there it will find nectar. So we really need to understand the remapping of information across bodies that change. Um, another uh, kind of drastic uh, example is shown by these planaria. These are flatworms and uh, they regenerate. We'll talk more about them shortly. So you can train the planaria to look for uh, food where these little bumpy discs are, and then you cut off their brain. Uh, in fact, the whole head, the tail sits there doing nothing for eight or nine days. It regenerates, it rebuilds a brand new brain. That information is again imprinted on the new brain. And now once again, you can see that it remembers where to go. Um, this, this, this sounds like uh, this, is, this is some kind of special feature of, of uh, butter, butterflies and, uh, and, and uh, planaria, but actually we, we are all this to some extent because um, even, even, even just beyond the kind of a brain um, uh, re remodeling of, of puberty and maturation and, and, and so on, uh, none of us are, are, are molecularly the same at any point in time. We are constantly in flux and remapping uh, memories actively onto our new context is um, critical. You might ask what happens to human patients in a few years that are going to receive um, stem cell implants into their brain for degenerative brain disease. What's going to happen to um, to the to that to that patient, their personality? You know, um, this the, the butterfly caterpillar thing is uh, is, is closer um, to us than we think. Now, it also uh, that that ability to remap certain competencies and, and certain kinds of information onto new scenarios is really critical for evolution. We discovered some years ago that if you take a tadpole, so this is a tadpole of a frog, here's the mouth, here are the nostrils, here's the brain, you'll notice that we prevented the two primary eyes from forming, but we did grow an eye on its tail. And when you do that, you find out that these animals can actually see perfectly well. How do we know? Because we built a machine to train them on visual cues. And we show that uh, this animal in a um, new sensory motor architecture, this, this eye doesn't even connect to the brain. It connects to the spinal cord here. You can see the, the optic nerve um, synapses right there on the spinal cord. That's enough for, to remap all the behavioral repertoires of this, of this uh, system with no extra evolutionary generations. You don't need cycles of selection to make this work. In one generation, you radically change the sensory motor architecture, no problem. Everything gets remapped, um, vision, learning, every, everything works. And, and that, that has huge implications for evolution. The fact that um, evolution does not commit to uh, um, a kind of uh, an over-reliance on how things were before or, and try to uh, persist with the exact same information, it actually um, builds problem-solving uh, agents that are able to remap information in new contexts. And the reason this works is because we uh, are, we as, as living things, we are composed of a multi-scale competency architecture. Every layer in the, in the body has certain capacities for solving problems in various spaces. So all the way up, it's not just brains and behavior that does this, it's all of the different um, components. And um, this is, uh, this is uh, what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, so something very, I find very interesting, Alan Turing, um, who was, of course, uh, the forefather of, of computer science and really thought, thought very deeply about what is intelligence, uh, what are minds, how can they be implemented, and so on. Um, and so he was interested in problem-solving machines and intelligence through reprogrammability, so reprogrammable machines. He also wrote this paper, um, which was on the chemical basis of morphogenesis, the generation of order out of a well-mixed chemical system. Now, why would somebody who's interested in, in, um, in intelligence and minds and reprogrammability and so on be worried about what's happening with the chemicals in uh, early embryos? I think that Turing saw a very profound symmetry between the problem of where minds come from and the problem of where bodies come from. I actually think it's the same problem. And although he didn't write much about it uh, at all, as far as I know, I think he understood uh, very well the, um, uh, the, 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 the fact that these are fundamentally, the, uh, in a deep sense, the same problem. And so, so let's talk about it. Where do bodies come from? So, so we start life like this, a collection of cells uh, of embryonic blastomeres, and eventually you get this. This is a cross section through a human torso. Look at the amazing complexity of all of these different components. Everything is the right shape, the right size, next to the right thing. Where is this pattern 
stored. Now, a lot of people today would say, well, it's in the DNA, of course, it's in the genome, but we can read genomes now. We know that this pattern isn't in the genome any more than the structure of, a, uh, of an insect uh, um, uh, colony or the, sh the precise sh shape of a spider web is in their genome. Genomes don't talk about shapes. Genomes specify proteins, little tiny uh, uh, hardware that every cell gets to have. And so now we need to understand Okay, so given that hardware, how does, the, how does the system know what to build? How do they know when to stop? How do we convince them to repair or recreate when something is missing? And as engineers, we can ask one more thing. Um, what, what, can, how, how far could we push them to do something else? Cells with exactly the same genome, what else would they be willing to build if we uh, convince them that they should be building something different? How might we do that? Well, as we think in towards the future of uh, what, um, what our field of um, regenerative medicine should look like, I think what we're really talking about is something that um, I call the anatomical compiler. The idea is that someday you will be able to sit in front of a computer, uh, draw the animal or plant that you want, the shape of it. And what the system will do is compile down to a set of stimuli that need to be given to cells to get them to build exactly that. In this case, this nice uh, three-headed um, flatworm. Um, the reason we need, we need this, first, there's a very practical reason is because uh, birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of these things would go away if we knew how to convince groups of cells to build specific things. So all of, the, all of these are problems of information processing. Uh, also more, more fundamentally, it, it would mean that we've solved the really deep questions of, of morphogenesis, of evolution, and so on. The thing to keep in mind then is that this, this anatomical compiler is not a 3D printer. It's not about micromanaging the position of cells. You're not trying to build this from scratch. It's a translation device. It, it communicates your anatomical goals to the cellular collective so that it would be motivated to build them. That, that's, the, that, that's the dream of the technology. Now, we are extremely far away from having this, and you might wonder why, because um, molecular biology, genetics has been going full tilt for decades. Why are we still so far away from it? And it's basically the fact that we are very good at uh, molecular information. We're very good at uh, moving around molecules and so on. Uh, we really don't understand uh, large scale shape change at all. We don't have any of these capabilities yet. And that's because we, uh, and in biology, are still basically stuck where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. All of our most techno uh, exciting technologies today, so CRISPR, genomic editing, um, uh, pathway engineering, uh, uh, protein design, all of these things are about the hardware. This is, this is what it looked like to program a computer at that time. Um, but now, uh, when we want to switch from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring your computer. Why not? Because we have understood in computer technology the incredible benefit of taking advantage of the reprogrammability and the competency of your medium. It doesn't have to be all through the hardware. And so I think what biology is largely missing still and what we're just scratching the surface of is uh, how to uh, take advantage of and cooperate with the intelligence, with the competencies of the medium in which we are trying to engineer. And what do I mean by intelligence? Um, what I don't mean is human level uh, reflexive metacognition where you know how smart you are, you know your goals and so on. I don't mean that. I mean a much more basic uh, thing that defines the whole continuum of intelligence. And I think William James said it best when he said that intelligence is a degree of the ability to reach the same goal by different means. It's very much, um, it's a cybernetic definition. It's a teleological definition because it uh, focuses on not what the system is made of or how it got here. It focuses on the fact that it has a goal and it has some mechanism for achieving that goal. And the question is, uh, what kinds of novel scenarios, what kind of perturbations is that mechanism able to deal with? So for example, if you have two magnets, they're separated by a piece of wood, the magnet is never going to go around to meet its other magnet because in order to do that, it would have to temporarily get further from its goal. That delayed gratification is not something that magnets can do. They're too simple for that. Um, of course, in his example, uh, Romeo and Juliet um, are separated by all sorts of physical and, and social barriers. They have all kinds of long-term planning, all kinds, I mean, it didn't end well, granted, but, but, the, but the, they have all kinds of other ways to, um, uh, to try to get around these barriers. And then in between, you have all these other things. You have cells and autonomous vehicles and various kinds of animals and, and so on. Um, so, so let's talk about this very specifically. What kind of collective intelligence do cellular swarms deploy? 
well, let's look at development first. So we know development is reliable. So, so, so all, almost all of the time, uh, uh, human embryos give rise to um, human uh, human bodies. Uh, it's very reliable. That in itself is not uh, much uh, much intelligence. That is uh, simply the kind of the working out of um, of uh, uh, kind of emergent complexity. But there's more to it than that. It's the fact that it can actually achieve that from different starting states. So if you uh, cut embryos in half or into pieces you don't get half bodies, you get perfectly normal monozygotic twins, triplets, quadruplets, and so on. So this system can navigate to its goal, this ensemble of states corresponding to the normal human target morphology in this anatomical space from different starting positions and avoiding various uh, local maxima. Uh, some creatures can do it throughout their lifespan. So here's an axolotl. These guys regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, their ovaries, uh, portions of the brain and heart. And the way it happens is that if you amputate anywhere here, it will rapidly, these cells will work very hard to grow and remodel. And, th and then the most amazing thing happens, which is that then they stop. That's really the, the, the most incredible part of uh, regeneration is that they know when to stop. So, so when I talk about um, anatomical goals, I mean this capacity, not just that you get a complex limb out of a bunch of um, biochemical reactions, but the fact that if you try to deviate it from this position, it will actually do its uh, do its best, spend all kinds of energy to get back there, and then it stops. That is the basis of goal directed behavior in this anatomical space. So uh, uh, humans and other mammals can do it a little bit. So humans regenerate their liver. Um, human children regenerate their fingertips. Deer regenerate antlers. So the same structure, um, a centimeter and a half of new bone per day when they're regenerating this. So we have this we have this a little bit, but um, we're not we're not great at it. But some creatures are, are amazing. I want to show you uh, one example um, of what I mean by um, uh, a kind of uh, creative problem solving uh, by this uh, by the salamander. So, so these amphibians, uh, here, here's a cross section through a normal uh, kidney tubule. There's about eight to 10 cells that work together to uh, build, this, build this tubule. One, one trick you can do is uh, uh, force the cells to have extra numbers of chromosomes. And if, they, if you do that, the cells get bigger. So, so amazing thing number one is that you still get a normal newt, even though it has multiple copies of its genome, that doesn't seem to bother it. So, so no problem, um, uh, but the cells get bigger. And when the cells get bigger, the newt stays the same size. And the only way that's gonna happen is if, is if fewer cells now participate in this thing. Uh, and that's, in fact, that's what they do. Uh, the most amazing thing happens when you make, uh, I think this is a six N, five N polyploid newts that have way too much genetic material. These guys uh, actually make, make enormous cells and there's only room for one. So what does the cell do? It bends around itself to give you that same lumen. So, so look at what's happening here. Uh, two, two, two things to notice. First, that in the service of a large scale anatomical outcome, having a tubule, the system calls up different molecular mechanisms, in this case, cell to cell communication, in this case, cytoskeletal bending to achieve its goal. Same goal by different means. That is a kind of intelligence. The other thing that's going on here is just think about this from the perspective of a nude embryo. You're coming into the world. You have to be able to construct yourself not knowing how many copies of your genomic instructions you're going to have. You don't know how big your cells are going to be. You don't know how many cells you're going to have. There's a lot you don't know. And in these novel environments, you, uh, in, in not only the external environment is novel, but your own parts, you can't even rely on your own parts. All of that um, is, is changing too. So this, this remarkable ability, not just to make complexity, but to make, uh, to make specific functional anatomies despite novelty and novel situations is a key aspect of uh, intelligent behavior in anatomical space. Um, another another uh, uh, example that, that I like a lot, this is something we discovered years ago that uh, tadpoles need to become frogs. And in order to do that, they have to rearrange their face. So they have to move their eyes, their mouth, their, their, their nostrils, everything has to move around. And it used to be thought that this was a hardwired process. Every one of these organs moved in the right direction, the right amount, and you get your frog. So this is why it's important to do experiments in these things and not just assume. What we did was we created so-called Picasso tadpoles, where we basically scrambled all the craniofacial organs. So here, the, um, the, the eyes on top of the head, the mouth is off to the side. It's, I mean, it's to totally scrambled. Well, these things, it turns out, um, re uh, remodel into quite normal frogs because all of the organs will move in new paths. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they actually have to double back until they get to a correct frog face. And so what the genetic actu genetics actually gives you is a uh, highly... Um, a competent system that uh, 
uh, can reduce error. It's an error minimization scheme. What it's able to do is keep working until it gets to its goal. It doesn't blindly just go the same way and hope everything works out. So that raises a very uh, obvious question. How does it know what a correct frog face looks like? How does it remember the set point, right? Any, any homeostatic process like this has to be able to uh, store a set point. So we started studying the one uncontroversial example of um, cell groups that store goals, and that's the brain. And in the brain, this is all done by, uh, by an electrochemical network, cells here by using these little ion channels, these little proteins that uh, allow uh, ions uh, like sodium, potassium, and so on to get in and out. They acquire a voltage state. That voltage state propagates to its neighbors and the whole network can now store and process information. For example, it can keep goal states. Here's what that physiology looks like in the zebrafish. This group made an amazing video. Um, and the commitment of neuroscience is that if you were to be able, if you were to measure all this physiology and be able to decode it, then you would know what the animal is thinking about. You would be able to get at the memories, the goals, the preferences, all of that stuff. Okay. So it turns out that um, evolution caught on to this, the fact that these electrical networks can serve as a kind of cognitive glue. They can bind individual cells together into a collective that remembers uh, and, and executes um, goal um, implementing behaviors that are much larger than any of the individual cell. That, that was discovered around the time of bacterial biofilms. It's extremely ancient. Um, even uh, so, so every cell in your body has ion channels. Most of them have these electrical connections to their neighbors. They're called gap junctions. And what we started to, to ask was, uh, could we could we take the deep lessons of neuroscience? And it turns out that not, o not only can you can you um, appropriate the lessons of neuroscience, but actually all of the tools. So the drugs, the the optogenetics, all the, all the tools of neuroscience. And can we ask, what was the body thinking about before it had a brain, both evolutionarily and developmentally? Could we read the electrophysiology of the body cells and ask if there was a collective here that's, that made decisions in anatomical space, the way that brains help us make decisions in three-dimensional space? So we developed the first tools, the first molecular tools, to read and write um, the uh, information into the non-neural uh, mind of the body. So, so here is a um, an early frog embryo. You can the, we're using a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. So this is real data. These are, this is not a simulation. This is a real um, embryo. You can see all the electrical conversations that the cells are having with each other. Who's going to be head, tail, um, and top, and bottom, and so on. We do a lot of computational simulation to try and understand how how all of this works. I want to show you. Uh, an example of what these pattern memories look like. The first we call the electric face. Um, this is an early frog embryo putting its face together. It's a time lapse video, about probably probably about 12 to 18 hours. And what you're seeing here is here, here's one frame out of that video. You see that the voltage patterns, what we're tracking here is the voltage of each individual cell is being reported. Um, already before, long before the genes come on to regionalize that face, Already, you can see here's where the mouth is going to go. Here's where the animal's right eye is going to go. Here are the placodes. Uh, the left eye comes in shortly after that. Uh, this is this is what these cells are remembering as what a correct uh, tadpole face is. This is what they're going to build. We know this is important for normal face development because if we move any of these or change any of these patterns, the gene expression will change and the anatomy will change to suit. I'm going to show you this in a minute. And then, of course, so, so that's the normal pattern, and you might want to monitor that for birth defects and so on. This is a pathological pattern that you get when you inject a human oncogene into this. So eventually it'll make a tumor, but long before that, you can already see these cells are, are electrically disconnecting from their neighbors. They're depolarizing. They're not interested in what, these, uh, what, what the collective has to say about what they should be building. They're now amoebas at this point. The rest of the body is just external environment to them. And we'll talk about this, this shifting border between self and world and how the, how the cognitive light cone of these cells shrinks. Okay, so so looking at looking at these patterns is 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 great, but but the more important thing is can we rewrite them? Can we show that they're functionally important? And the way we do that is not with there are no applied fields, there are no magnets, there's no um, electromagnetic radiation, there are no waves, no frequencies. What we're doing is we're hacking the interface that the cells normally use to hack each other. This is how cells normally control each other. They could through through the ion channels and the gap junctions that are on their surface. So we developed some, some tools to read and write electrical states into these tissues. Now, um, I'll show you some examples of what happens when you do that. The, the, by the way, when we first uh, proposed this uh, quite, quite some time ago, um, everybody thought that membrane voltage was a housekeeping parameter and that basically if you mess with it, what you get is uninterpretable death, uh, toxicity and, and death. And, and I'm gonna show you that that in fact is not what happens. Uh, 
this is uh, one, one, one of the early examples where what we can do is I, sh I showed you that electric face and there was a little voltage um, pattern that is uh, the that was where the eye was going to form. And what happens if you move that pattern somewhere else? And you can do that by taking an early frog embryo, injecting some cells that are going to be this posterior part of the animal, inject them with some RNA that encodes a particular uh, uh, potassium. In this case, it's a potassium ion channel. So when you inject this RNA, what it's going to do is, is cause the cell to have a new kind of potassium flux, which will change the voltage to be a little spot that's like that eye spot. Guess what happens when you do that? These cells get the message very rapidly and they become an eye. If, and they, so here's the eye sitting on the gut of the animal. If you do that, these eyes have the right um, lens and retina, optic, and all, all the same stuff. And there's a few interesting things that you learn from this. First, you learn that bioelectric, these bioelectric pattern memories are instructive. Okay, it's not about messing things up. You can actually call up new organs by, tell, by giving them the pattern they're supposed to be, that resetting the memory of these cells of what it is that they're building. That's first. Second, uh, it's very modular. All the, all the competencies in the recipient, I mean, we didn't put in enough information to say how to make an eye. We just, uh, we just said, build an eye here. And, and they do all the rest. They already know how to build an eye, but, but they needed to be convinced to do so. Um, also, you find out that uh, this, uh, that the, these, these cells in, in the bi developmental biology textbook, it'll tell you that these cells, anything beyond, behind this, this front of the head here is incompetent to make eye. And this is where we need to learn um, a lot of humility because every assessment of competency or intelligence is basically us, uh, we, we ourselves are taking an IQ test. Yes, if you prompt it with the uh, so-called master eye gene pack six, then yeah, they're not going to make an eye. That only works up here in the front of the head. But if you find the thing that they that they actually respond to, which is this, this bioelectric prompt, then in fact, you find out that they're plenty competent to do it. And so it's not their competency that's, that's in question here. It's how good are we at recognizing the right way to communicate our goals to these cells. And finally, now this I thought was pretty cool, which is that uh, he, this is a, a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere. The blue cells are the ones we injected. Uh, okay, these are the ones that we, we gave them the potassium flow to try to convince them to be an eye. But what they did was they recruited a bunch of their neighbors to help because there's not enough of them to make an eye. These, these cells, we didn't touch any of these cells directly. They, they, they recruited their, their neighbors. And of course, other collective intelligences do this too. So ants and termites will recruit their buddies to help them move something that's too big and, and so on. So, so, so now you're starting to see how we can actually read and write the uh, the information, but but the recipient is not a blank canvas. It's actually a very competent material that knows how to do all kinds of things that we do not have to teach it to do. This, of course, uh, is leading to some regenerative medicine applications. So here's a frog that when they lose their legs 45 days later, nothing happens. They don't regrow them. We developed a bioelectric cocktail that triggers regeneration. It's again, so within 45 days, you've already got uh, some toes, you've got a toenail, um, all the pro-regenerative genes are coming on here. Eventually a pretty respectable leg that's touch sensitive and motile. Uh, the leg can grow for a year and a half. The intervention is only 24 hours. So it's not a matter of micromanagement. It's not a matter of telling every cell what it has to be or talking to the stem cells or controlling gene expression. It isn't any of that. It's right at the beginning, trying to uh, give these cells a prompt, a trigger that says, go to the leg building uh, region of morphous space, not to the scarring region. And here uh, I must do a disclosure because David Kaplan and I have a spin-off company called Morphoceuticals, where we're trying to use bioreactors uh, on uh, uh, limb uh, wounds of uh, rodents to uh, try to get uh, limb regeneration happening in, um, in mammals. So um, stay tuned uh, for, for that. So, okay. Um, I want to switch gears for a couple of minutes and talk about um, an, another place where you can actually see these pattern memories, and that is with the planaria. So planaria are very interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, they are highly regenerative, so you can cut them into pieces. Every piece remembers what the entire worm is supposed to look like. Okay, so every piece regenerates into a collect worm. Uh, the, the record, I believe, is something like 275 pieces. Uh, they're highly regenerative, they are cancer resistant, and they are immortal. So these asexual worms here, which reproduce by fission, uh, they do not age, okay? There's no, no such thing as an old um, asexual planarian. Now they do all this, uh, I would have said a couple of years ago, I would have said despite, now I say because of, because I think now we kind of understand more about how this works, an incredibly noisy genome. Uh, their genome, they're, they're, they can be mixoploid. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes because 
being um, uh, being re reproducing by fission, so they pull themselves in half and, re and, and regenerate, they don't uh, throw away all of the somatic mutations, the body mutations that we do when we reproduce, right? Your children do not inherit all the mutations that you got in your body. Uh, these guys do. And for that reason, um, their genome is a mess. And yet they're the ones with the highly regenerative cancer resistance and immortality. So we wanted to ask a very simple question. When we, when we cut a planarian into thirds, you get this middle fragment like this. How does this middle fragment know how many heads it's supposed to have? Well, it turns out there's an electrical circuit that uh, specifies the fact that they normally need to have one head. And this is extremely reliable. This happens correctly all the time. But what you can do, and so here's the circuit, we, you can see one head, one tail, and that's, and, and that's what they will build. What we've been able to do is rewrite this information to say, no, two heads. And it's a little bit messy. The technology is still um, in its infancy, but we can say two heads. And if you do that, this middle fragment will build a two-headed worm. Now, the amazing thing about this is that this is not an electrical map of this creature. This is an electrical map of an anatomically normal one-headed animal in which we changed the representation. If you don't cut him, he say, stays one-headed. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with him anatomically. There's nothing wrong with him in terms of gene expression, which is what you're seeing here. It's only when you, when you amputate that the tissue actually consults the memory to know what to do. So it is a latent memory, but also it is a counterfactual memory. It is not true for this creature right now. It is a memory of what it's going to do in the future if it gets injured. It's the ability, this is, this is showing you Two things. First, I, I promised you that uh, we were going to see what these pattern memories actually look like to read them out of the collective intelligence of the brain. This is it. When you ask, uh, how does it know how many heads? L literally, this is it. This is the memory that, um, uh, that, that stores it. And the second, the second thing is that it is able to store a representation of what to do that is different from what's going on now. Uh, people in cognitive uh, neuroscience call that mental time travel, the ability to hold thoughts about things other than what's going on right now, so past and future. So the body and, and the collective intelligence uh, of, this, of this creature is able to do this primitive thing. This is, I, I think, where a lot of our cognitive tricks come from is, is this kind of stuff. So the body of a planarian can store at least one of two different memories of what a proper planarian is going to look like to guide future regenerative events. Um, like any good memory, this thing uh, remarkably is stable. So if I take these two-headed worms and I continue to cut them in plain water, no more manipulation of any kind, they continue in perpetuity to regenerate two-headed, even though their genome is perfectly normal. We never touch the genome. There's nothing wrong with their genome, uh, but that's not where the memory is. Okay, so if you ask um, where is the memory, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a subtle question. I mean, the genetics certainly gives you a piece of hardware that by default comes with the memory that says one head, but that memory is not nailed down by that hardware, is actually rewritable. And so here you can see these, uh, you can see these worms uh, hanging out. Not only can you convince them to have uh, the wrong number of heads, you can actually convince them that they're a different species. So by cutting off the head of this triangular planarian, you can chase it into attractors in anatomical space that correspond to other species head shapes. So in a flat head like this P. felina, round head like this S. mediterranea, um, about 100 and, uh, between 100 and 150 million years distance between these species and this. But um, the hardware has no problem visiting these other uh, morphogenetic attractors the way that these species normally do. This is where they normally live. And not only the head shape, but actually the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells becomes just like these other species. So we now are starting to really see the, um, the, the power of this, of this reprogrammability, the idea that the cells are building to a specification. It's not just a, a feed forward thing where certain, well, certain rules get acted out and it is what it is. It actually is tracking towards a specific uh, end goal and it's actually minimizing error relative to that end goal. Now, what I wanna talk about is that um, not only can we change the, uh, not only can we change the goals, we can change the size of the goals. And evolution already did this. So, so the goals of this, of this little organism are extremely small. You can imagine the cognitive light cone, which is the size of the biggest goal it can muster, um, are very small. All it cares about are things that are happening within this uh, time and space of this, of this single cell. But when they come together, what evolution did, leveraging bioelectrical networks and various other things, what it did was... Uh, allow this collective to think of grandiose goals, huge. Uh, the, the idea that, that we're, we're, we're building this giant limb, and by the way, if the limb gets damaged, we're going to have to rebuild, and, and, and we're not happy until the limb is, is complete. At that point, every, the error drops and everything, you know, everything quiets down. But, but the, size of the, goal, the size of the goals is scaling up, 
And then of course it, that has a failure mode, which is cancer. In cancer, the size of the goal sc scales down. These, these are glioblastoma cells back down to their amoeba, their very modest amoeba-like uh, goals of, of proliferation and going wherever life is good. That's metastasis. So um, that leads to a uh, to a very specific uh, research program directly uh, for, um, uh, in the field of cancer, which is instead of trying to kill these cells with toxic chemotherapy, could we try to reinflate their goal states? Could we try to uh, raise their collective IQ so that they would go back to these these lofty uh, plans of of building um, skin and, and 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 livers and so on? And so when you do this, and and so we've done this, um, we were able to. Uh, 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 inject uh, human oncogenes and then co-inject uh, some some uh, ion channel constructs that would force the cells to remain in electrical connectivity. And here here you can see even even nasty um, oncogenes like KRAS that's strongly expressed. In fact, it's all over the place. This is the same animal. There's no tumor because these cells the the genetics are are broken, but the physiology is what drives. It's the it's the it's the fact that they're connected to a coll collective and the collective is remembering what it's supposed to be doing. So an overview of, uh, and then I just have a couple more things to say after that, um, in, an overview of what I think is going on uh, with the future of medicine and the reason that these, these deep questions that, um, that uh, JTF and, and, uh, and, and people who are interested in, in uh, basal cognition and collective intelligence, the reason all this matters so much is because Everything in biomedical interventions has been focused around here, these bottom-up micromanagey kind of things, you know, surgery and, and synthetic biology and so on. But but there's a whole there's a whole um, uh, ocean of opportunity here around. We didn't even talk about this stuff, behavior shaping and trying to train networks, but all of these prompts and triggers and which we'll talk about momentarily, agential implants and so on, that are really targeting the protocognitive capacities of cells and tissues. We're not micromanaging it. Uh, we are trying to um, uh, convince them, get, get buy-in and convince them using all of the tools. And this is, this is why, why uh, this is an empirical question, because basically the hypothesis is simply this. You can use the tools of behavioral and cognitive science to control these things. It's not all about um, bottom-up chemistry. And my claim is that, and you can see the, you can see the details um, here and everything spelled out in, in these papers. My claim is that future medicine is gonna look more, a lot more like a, a, a weird kind of somatic psychiatry, not so much like chemistry. And um, bioelectricity is that interface layer. It's the, it's the same thing that, that is used in mind-body medicine, but it's that, it, that uh, biophysical mechanism that holds and, uh, and maintains the, the set points for these uh, collective uh, collective uh, cell groups, and that is what we can hack. And um, I want to point out that we are actually not the only um, uh, we're not the only in bioengineers. We're not, not the only hackers. If you look at uh, a, 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 an acorn, this is what it makes. This is the typical uh, uh, oak leaf. And you might, because of how reliable this is, you might get the idea that what the oak genome knows how to do is build exactly this flat green thing, right? That's what that's what genomes are, are good for. But uh, there's this, which is this amazing uh, evolved bioengineer, this little uh, this little parasite uh, wasp, and what it will do is uh, lay lay down so, uh, an egg and some other chemicals that prompt the cells to build this incredible gall. So this is not made up of wasp cells. This is made up of the plant cells. And it is also not an example of genetic modification. This, this, um, this, this creature uh, has figured out how to prompt a new competency from these leaves uh, that we would have never known, right? If this, if this hadn't happened, we would have no idea that a genome that typically builds uh, flat green things like this is actually capable of building something like this. So this is what we need to understand, actually. We need to understand the, the capabilities, that, that latent space around uh, the one uh, kind of, or maybe a couple outcomes that we see. This, this goes way deeper than just um, developmental plasticity. So I wanna show in the last few minutes, I just wanna show you some, some examples of rebooting multicellularity. This is, uh, so this is the beginnings of uh, what we call um, the construction of xenobots. What we did was uh, take some uh, epithelial skin cells off of an early frog embryo. They could do many things. They could, do, they could have died. They could have spread out, formed a nice two-dimensional monolayer. Instead, what they do is here, um, overnight, they, they, they coalesce together, okay? And they become this. It's a little self-contained, uh, self-motile organism that uses little cilia, little hairs that are normally typically used to um, move mucus down the body of the of the tadpole, and uh, and this is what they use to swim. 
and they can go in circles, they can kind of patrol back and forth, they can have collective uh, behaviors of, of, of different kinds. Um, here's one uh, going down a maze. So, so here it is uh, swimming down. Uh, it's going to take this corner without bumping into the opposite wall. So it takes the corner. And at this point, it turns around for some internal reason that we don't know, and it goes back where it came from. The idea is to understand what else are cells and tissues capable of, and, and, and more fundamentally, where do these goals come from? Here's something interesting that these, uh, that these guys can do. It's called kinematic self-replication. When provided with a loose collection of cells, what they will do is run around and collect them into little piles. And because they're working with an agential material, the same way that evolution was in the same that way that we as engineers were working with, not a passive material, but a bunch of cells, uh, these little piles mature. And guess what they become? They become the next generation of xenobots. And when they mature, what do they do? They repeat the process and do exactly the same thing. And you get multiple generations. Now, this is, this is quite interesting because we could ask, what did the frog genome learn? Well, the traditional story is that it provided this solution to the problem of how to survive a froggy environment. And then this is what it learned. And here are the standard developmental stages. And then here's the tadpole behavior. But it also can do this, and here's the weird uh, developmental um, stages of a, of a xenobot and then completely different behaviors. The thing is, there's never been any xenobots before. There was never selection to be a good xenobot. No other uh, creature reproduces by uh, kinematic self-replication. Why does this work? Where, where, does it, um, where does it come from? And I want to connect this, this to, the, to the biomedical uh, slant that we had a moment ago, which is, which is this. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, this little video. Watch, watch this little guy moving around, and I, I could ask, what, what do you think this is? And you might think that this is some a little protoorganism that I got um, off of the uh, the bottom of a pond uh, somewhere. And uh, I'll tell you that if you sequence the genome of this thing, what you see is 100% Homo sapiens. This is made entirely of adult patient cells, uh, and this is a road a roadmap towards personalized agential interventions. But here's what I mean by that: the way we create these is um, we get uh, uh, donor cells from from adult human patients, no embryonic stuff going on here. Adult human patients. There's a particular protocol that causes them to become these little uh, cilia lined. They start off as little organoids. They they get lined with these cilia and they start running around like the xenobots I showed you a moment ago. So if you were thinking that well, xenobots I mean, we know that um, embryos are pretty plastic and amphibia are also pretty plastic. Maybe it's some kind of weird uh, frog specific thing that they do this, you know, developmental biologists call them animal caps. Maybe this is just an animal cap thing. Well, if you think that way, what you wouldn't do is make anthrobots, but here we are, um, here are the anthrobots. And um, one thing that you can see, so this is, this, this gray stuff here are human neural cells plated uh, on a Petri dish. And we made a scar here, like a, like a scratch wound basically. And what, uh, what you'll see is that, is that these little anthrobots, they can, they can navigate the wound. And uh, when they pile up at a particular location in this wound, we call this a super bot because there's probably eight or nine or 10 of these things here. What they do is they cause the, the, they, they cause the neurons to grow across the gap. A couple of days later, you lift them up and here's what you can see. They took the two sides of the, of the neural um, wound and they, and they healed them together. Now, this is, this is just the first thing we discovered. No, no doubt this is just the beginning of, of all kinds of unexpected things. But who would have thought that your tracheal cells, which sit quietly for decades uh, in your airway, actually, if given the opportunity, could uh, come together, form a, uh, a different uh, kind of life form with um, different behaviors, with the ability to heal other body tissues in your body, uh, without any genetic modification, without any need for um, uh, immunosuppression. If these things are, are used in the body, they're, they're your own cells. They share all the priors with you, with your body about what health and disease is, what inflammation is. They don't have to be um, uh, genetically engineered. There are no scaffolds here, no weird nanomaterials. It's just releasing the natural healing competencies of your own cells. There is uh, so much that we don't know about what these, um, what all these guys are capable of. So I want to, I want to end uh, here just by, by saying this, that, uh, because, because life is so good at remapping information, uh, life basically assumes that everything is going to change. Evolution and, and mutation means your body's going to change, the environment is going to change, everything's going to change. And so every embryo and every new morphogenetic system has to uh, not take the priors too seriously and remap what it knows onto a new context. I've shown you many examples of that, which means that life is incredibly interoperable. Any combination of evolved material, 
uh, engineered material and software is some kind of agent. We already have some examples of cyborgs and hybrids, and you're going to have humans uh, with all kinds of different proportion of new parts and new new organs and so on. All of this, all of this is coming. Um, everything that Darwin meant when he said endless forms most beautiful is a tiny corner of this uh, state space of possible bodies and minds, which is going to be um, here with us in the coming decades. And that means that uh, we have to drop some old uh, uh, untenable categories, these binary categories of man, machine, uh, all this stuff. Uh, these, these are no good. Um, we're going to have to get beyond questions of what do you look like and how did you get here, meaning randomly evolved versus engineered, in order to understand how to ethically relate to others. We are going to have to work out ways to relate to minds and bodies that are nowhere on the tree of life with us, that are not like us, and um, come up with much better categories than what we've been working with before. And what we call AI right now, these language models, which are uh, everybody's arguing about them, and they are so easy to distinguish from the kinds of things that uh, we have been dealing with in, in the human world, but, but they, are not the, they are not the difficult case. They are just the most easy uh, kind of first part. We are going to have all sorts of hybrid uh, beings uh, that, are, that are part uh, evolved, part um, designed, and part software. So, okay, uh, I'm going to stop here and just, uh, just tell you that, well, uh, summarize what I've said. Um, intelligence is everywhere. We need to re rise above our uh, poor ability to recognize it in unfamiliar guises. This is going to be critical for biomedicine and for the ethical flourishing of not just humanity, but all sentient beings. Um, we have a research agenda, a, a principle framework to try to get beyond uh, these old uh, poles of teleophobia on the one hand and animism on the other hand. Um, JTF has been hugely important in this in this arena, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, and the future consists of um, dumping these these concepts, which are not going to serve as well, and move forward um, in a couple of uh, really interesting areas. So I'm just going to thank um, the people, the uh, postdocs and grad students who contributed to this work. Uh, again, thanks to the, the the JTF for the funding that has moved a lot of this forward, our co collaborators, and uh, most of all, the animal model systems that we've learned from. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. That was super stimulating. Um, everything that I had hoped for in your talk. So um, I'm going to close us down. Since we're on the hour, I want to thank you again, Mike, cool. for joining us. And for Thank you so much. Talk. And uh, yeah to chatting with you more in the future. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you all so much. All right. All right.